Charleston Waterkeeper was founded many years ago to protect and restore Charleston's waterways for our community. Today, I talk one-on-one -on -one with Executive Director Andrew Wonderlay for this edition of Quentin's Full Subs. And if you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube channel and like Quentin's Full Subs on Facebook. Andrew Wonderlay, welcome to Quentin's Full Subs. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Quentin. I'm glad to be here. Yes, sir. I know it's been a long time coming, as I said earlier. Yeah. <laughs> it has. It has. I, I, I knew we would eventually connect. and uh, excited to be doing this. Well, thank you so much. Obviously, you are the executive director, if I'm, not, if I'm correct, of the Charleston yeah. Waterkeeper. And, of course, you all defend and restore uh, Charleston waterways so that, obviously, we can fish and swim without fear of pollution. What's new? What's now with your organization? Oh, wow. Uh <laughs> We've always got a lot going on. Uh, you know, our, our mission is is obviously clean water. You stated it really well, but uh, you know, the, the 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 thing is, is there's no shortage of threats, uh, and everything is made worse by climate change and sea level rise and, and changing weather patterns and all that. And so, everything we see from whether industrial facilities are complying with their permits and how much pollution they're emitting to how much bacteria washes into the water during storms and floods mm. to the health of our salt marshes and the health of our oyster reefs. Uh, all of it is under threat. And so it, it's, it's, re <laughs> it's really not what's new. It's what's most pressing at, at this given time, if, if I could kind of rephrase it for a moment. But, cool. uh, you know, right now for us during the summer months, folks are out on the water. They're enjoying, you know, being... Uh, you know, swim off the neighborhood dock, catching crabs from the from the local dock, from the local pier. Uh, you know, fishing, swimming, paddling, surfing, sailing. It seems like everybody's in the water these days. And you know, the problem is is that the water isn't always safe for those recreational activities. And you know, until we started sampling back in 2013, nobody could tell you whether it was safe to swim or to paddle or to enjoy any of that kind of thing. And so. Uh, it's really important for folks to pay attention to what the data says about local water quality. And we know after all these years of testing, we know really well that after rainstorms and floods, like we've been having lately, water quality is really poor and bacteria levels are very high. And that means that you could be exposed to pathogens. Uh, and we did a little study with the College of Charleston uh, late last year and early this year, and they found DNA from cholera, tuberculosis, uh, staph, vibriosis, some really nasty things that, that can get you sick uh, if you're not paying attention to the data. So, you know, we, we publish it every Friday, May through October. It goes out to the public. A couple of local news stations cover it, uh, which has been great to get that word out to help keep the public safe. And, you know, we do that so folks can make informed choices about when and where they choose to go swimming and, and paddling and, and fishing and, and crabbing. So pay attention, keep yourself safe, keep you and your family safe. Um, but other than that, you know, we, we continue to see really, really weak environmental oversight. Uh, you know, DHEC is our state regulatory, our state environmental regulatory agency. And uh, they do, uh, you know, just the minimum of what EPA and federal law require. And so if we want better environmental protections in our community, you have to rely on the environmental conservation community to do it. And so that comes from the public. We get involved on behalf of the public in all kinds of issues from the little plastic pellets called myrtles to whether facilities are complying with stormwater permits uh, and a whole host of other things. So, you know, we continue to step into that void and, and, and work to hold polluters accountable for following environmental laws. Now, Andrew, let me ask you, obviously, you've read about the TV, TV uh, data, obviously, in the newspaper and obviously on mm -hmm. television as well. Where was it the highest here in the low country? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> the critical question, maybe, right? Uh, so what we know is uh, bacteria is an indicator for the presence of these pathogens, right? So the more bacteria there is, the more you're likely to you're you're going to be exposed to those pathogens. Mm -hmm. And so hot spots for bacteria right now are the upper reaches of Shem Creek up towards the Bowman Road area, mm -hmm. uh, the upper portions of James Island Creek around the Harbor View, excuse me, around the Folly Road Bridge. Cool. And then Philbin Creek is the surprise one this year. Philbin Creek in North Charleston, it's right under the Don Hall Bridge, right next okay. to the paper mill. 
Okay. And it's a wonderful little park there called Hendricks Park, and folks fish and crab and 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 put in boats and kayaks there. It's just a, it's a really great community resource, but it has had astronomically high levels of bacteria this year. Uh, and so that's something we've been really working to highlight. A lot of our communications and messaging has been focused on Philbank Creek this year. Uh, there's going to be some opportunities, I hope, with the city of North Charleston to get some of, to get, to get some of that cleaned up and to, and to really get a handle on what is causing those high bacteria, high bacteria levels so we can keep folks safe up there. What are those levels right now, particularly in that park? <laughs> so uh we last sampled on uh last wednesday we'll, we'll sample again this wednesday we do it every week uh and i think last wednesday we were uh 1500 uh colony forming units of bacteria per 100 milliliters now to give you an example or to give you some perspective excuse me the the standard for safe recreational use is 104 uh, if you're harvesting oysters out of those waters, which nobody should be because that creek is closed and the Cooper River is closed for oyster harvesting. But to give you some perspective, the standard for safe oyster harvesting is 35 quality forming units per 100 milliliters. So that sample, the last sample came up from last week came in at, you know, 15 times the state standard for safe recreational use. Uh, that's not the highest result that we've had this year. We've, we've actually maxed out the ability of our tests to measure bacteria and had uh, one sample that was 240 times the state standard for safe recreational use. So, you know, th that's not just a high result. It's an astronomically high result, which suggests to me that there's a real big problem mm -hmm. with how the watershed of Phil and Creek is handling both uh, wildlife and pet waste, but also mm. human sewage. I suspect a, a component of that bacteria is coming from human sources. Ooh. And what's that percentage for pet waste? So that's the difficult thing, right? Mm. Without very expensive and time-consuming DNA testing, uh, we don't know uh, is, the, is the short answer. But based on what we've seen in other creeks around the Charleston area, like James Island Creek and Shem Creek, we know that the most likely sources are probably uh, pet waste, mm. wildlife waste. So we're talking about birds and, and, uh, and you know, could, could even be, you know, the odd alligator or two uh, in that area, believe it or not. <laughs> and Ooh. so, uh, you know, so it could be wildlife, pet waste, but then we also know there's a component from sewer overflows. So during a rainstorm, when a sewer overflows, all that water could drain into the creek. There also may be some septic tanks still in that watershed, but we, we don't know. And that's why we're, we're hoping to better understand where that bacteria is coming from so we can target solutions to each individual source. Where do you all suspect that the septic tanks are located right now in those locations? So that's a great question. And again, we don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a really difficult problem because uh, DHEC will permit a septic tank. Mm. You know, you need a permit from DHEC to, to, you know, to install one. But after it's been installed, uh, there's really no oversight, right? Mm. And so there's been septic tanks installed all throughout our watershed over the years as we've developed, uh, you know, as a community that are just kind of out of sight, out of mind. And so with, we'd have to work with the North Charleston Sewer District, the city of North Charleston, uh, in Charleston County to really understand where those septic tanks are and then help folks either have them pumped out, have them maintained, or where there is opportunity, maybe even connect them to public sewer. Uh, you see some of that work going on right now in James Island Creek. There's been a lot of press around James Island Creek and, you know, the problems it, 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 the problems it has with bacteria. And so I uh, would love to see a similar effort spin up around Philbin Creek and, and, and in the North Charleston area. Now, Andrew, let me ask you, where has there been recent sewer overflows? I know it rained over the weekend here yeah. and then, you know, a couple of days before yeah. that. Where do you see it now? So, uh, actually, uh, you know, the, the, the rain that we've been having, you know, the harder it rains, the, the, well, so the bigger issue is called inflow and infiltration. All that rainwater, stormwater, floodwater will, will go into the sewer system, which isn't designed to handle it. Mm. Right. It's only designed to handle wastewater from homes and businesses and that sort of thing. And so uh, typically what you see is in the lower parts of the system, right, uh, where all the water is moving towards. When it gets to those low parts of the system, it'll actually, you know, overflow a manhole and then, you know, it'll be in the street or it'll be uh, or it'll be in, the, you know, in, in, in 
drain away into the nearest creek or river. And uh, typically where we see those is in uh, the kind of the inner portions of West Ashley around the, you know, Burns Down area uh, and, and, and places like that. The Windermere area, I know it's yes. had some problems in the past. And so uh, areas like that are in the lower portions of the system and tend to receive the highest volume before it goes off to the treatment plant. Mm. Uh, and so what, you know, what folks can do, this is an important thing for the public to understand is if you see a sewer overflow, if you see a manhole that's, you know, leaking sewer water, uh, call your local sewer provider. And if you don't know who it is, call us and we'll help you report it. It's important for those folks to know where the, you know, where the system is leaking so they can go out and fix it. Uh, and then clean up afterwards. Uh, you know, we don't want folks coming into contact with that water. If an overflow does happen, we want to get it stopped as soon as possible uh, so it doesn't contaminate nearby creeks and rivers. Uh, so, you know, if, if you know, you can, um, you know, if you live in North Charleston, you'd call North Charleston Sewer District. If you live on James Island, you might call the James Island PSD. If you live in Mount Pleasant, you might call, uh, you know, you might call Mount Pleasant Waterworks. Right. Uh, and if, if you can't figure out who you should call, just call us and, and we can help you figure it out. Yes. And, and you know, Burns Down, South Windermere, that's usually my running mm -hmm. route there. But where, but how long has, has, they, has that particular area been in that lower part of the system? So it's always been low. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's always been low. And, uh, you know, I think it's always had problems. Uh, mm -hmm. Charleston Water System has done quite a bit of work over the years to help alleviate that, mm -hmm. uh, including some new tunnels and some deeper pumps and things like that. So hopefully, uh, as some of that rehab work gets done and some of that capacity gets expanded, that problem will become less and less frequent. Yes, sir. And let me ask you, where else, you know, is Charleston Water Works, you know, repairing these, those things that you just mentioned in those other areas? Yes. Right. Uh, so I know there's a lot of work going on in outer West Ashley, a lot oh, yes. of growth happening in that area. Uh, and I, I know they've been particularly focused on that area. They've also done some recent expansion at, uh, at Plum Island that should help receive that capacity. And I think that's where a lot of the focus has been lately. Yes, sir. And, and, and let me ask you, because I want to talk to you more about obviously mm -hmm. this weekend. And I know that you all posted this recently on uh, Instagram. You said this new yeah. swim alert. Things are a little worse yep. this week with five out of the 20 sites testing uh, red. We got more rain and with that comes stormwater runoff. Where yep. are the five red sites? So last week we had, uh, we had a couple of red in Shem Creek. We had mm. Philbin Creek. Actually, I think all of Shem Creek was, uh, was high last week. We had a uh, high result in Philbin Creek and a high result uh, near the Folly Road Bridge in, in James Island Creek. And th those are the sites where we typically see okay. problems, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the smaller, the smaller the creek, uh, think about it this way. All that water that ends up on the street during a rainstorm or a flood has to go somewhere, right? right? It goes down the drain in the street and it goes right through a pipe and it ends up at Shem Creek. It ends up in the harbor. It ends up in James Island. There's no, it's not treated. It doesn't go to Plum Island to be treated. Mm -hmm. Right. Flood water and rainwater are not treated before they end up in the harbor. And so what you see is a lot of that infrastructure, those stormwater pipes have been directed into creeks and rivers. And so that's where we typically see the highest bacteria results, right? That's a reflection of those waterways receiving all that polluted flood water. And, and this might be a silly question, Andrew, but what other sites mm -hmm. actually test the green? <laughs> well, we've got some ones that test really well, believe it or not. Uh, um, uh, uh, Dimitri Park on James oh, Island usually tests really well. We have a site that's kind of in the upper harbor or lower Cooper River, however you want, or lower Wando River, depending on how some folks describe it, right out by the Yorktown. Right. A lot of big water out there, a lot of water moving around. We very rarely have a high result there. Uh, the, uh, the Folly Beach uh, boat landing usually oh. tests really well. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a site that does well. Uh, Sol Agree boat landing yes. uh, on the Stono, that's a uh, personal favorite. That one usually does, uh, does really good as well. Wow, that's amazing. Now, <laughs> this might be a difficult question, but what does the mustery and all of color mean with this, uh, with the site? <laughs> right. So uh, we use like a, a color coding system as a real simple way to convey this information to the public, right? If it's green, that means our result was below the state standard for safe swimming. Right. If it's red, it means it was above, right? But bacteria data is, it's really critical to have frequent bacteria data. And if if there's not any result for at least a week, mm. after seven days, it turns to yellow, 
right? Uh, which means there's no there's no recent data, mm-hmm. right? And so it's kind of historical status. And so if there's been a mix of high and low results at a site, if it's yellow, uh, that means it's proceed with caution. And so typically, it uh, sounds like you've been looking at the swim guide, uh, which is a really great resource that we put our data into. Uh, we also take uh, we also take DHEX data from the beaches, right? So Charleston Waterkeeper samples in the creeks, rivers, and the harbor. DHEC samples about every two weeks mm. uh, on our marine beaches. So Isle of Palms, Sullivan's, mm. Bali, all of those, they do just about every other week. So if we don't have any recent data from DHEC, and they've been really good, they've been really good about giving us the data so we can include it in Swim Guide and all our public messaging. But if we don't have any recent data, the swim guide system automatically clicks that onto historical status, which is mm-hmm. why you see that that uh, that kind of mustard yellow color. Mm. What else, Andrew, surprises you when most of this data goes onto that historical data? Mm-hmm. Uh, what surprises me? Yes, sir. <laughs> you know, I, I we are really fortunate uh, to have marine beaches that test really well. Uh, I, you know, it's, and it's really a blessing. I mean, you know, the, our, you know, our beaches are so much a part of what this community is all about. And it's not like that everywhere in the state, right? Uh, Myrtle Beach has some real significant problems with bacteria, uh, from the swashes that empty right out onto the beach. And so, you know, you'll frequently see high bacteria results in the sampling from the Myrtle Beach Grand Strand area. But, you know, we just, fortunately, we haven't seen that here, uh, you know, what surprises me, though, is how high we get some bacteria results uh, in, in, the, in, you know, the harbor and our creeks and rivers, uh, it, you know, especially after, I mean, if, if we've had a big flood, if we've had a heavy rainstorm that didn't flood, but we've still just had a heavy rainstorm, we've had a hurricane or something like that, we generally see really, really poor water quality. And it always surprises me, not just that we get high results, that's kind of to be expected, but how high those results are, like we were talking about in Philbin Creek, you know, 240 times, so, you know, uh, uh, 15 times the state standard. You know, they, I mean, these are some astronomically high. They're not just high. They're astronomically high results, which yeah. suggests real problems, you know, with water quality in those watersheds. And, and what other problems do you foresee with Philbin Creek and Shim Creek, for instance? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think, uh, y- you know, uh, so many folks are coming to Charleston uh, and, and moving here and, and, you know, kind of uh, adopting our community as their new home. And, and, you know, that's got, you know, upsides and downsides. And I think one of the, you know, one of the downsides is folks come here from other communities and they look out at Shem Creek, they look out at, you know, Philbin Creek and, and, you know, they look out at, you know, the Ashley river or wherever it is. And they go, wow, this is just, it's beautiful. It's, you know, it's so pristine and we're lucky to have such a pristine harbor and, 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 um, and, you know, it, 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 there's a misconception here, I think that, you know, our waterways are pristine and perfectly healthy. That is not the case. We, you know, it's a totally engineered system, everything from the amount of fresh water that comes down the Cooper river from the lakes to, uh, the amount of salt water in the harbor to the depth of the harbor to how water flows over the land before it gets into, you know, Shem Creek or Philbin Creek or Noisette Creek or any of those places. And so it's helping folks understand that, hey, this is a really special place. And these waterways can be safe enough for us to use and enjoy for fishing, for crabbing, for swimming. You know, we, you know, but we also have a big responsibility to come together as a community and protect it, right? We're going to get the water quality that we stand up as a community and demand. And so that's what's really important, right? That these folks that come here, you know, learn about our waterways, learn about our watershed, and then become stewards and advocates for protecting them. Yes, indeed. And, and going back to the beaches, uh, what is the current water quality right now for yeah. the IOP in the Sullivan's Island and Foley Beach? Well, last I checked, it was really good. Uh, it's very, very rare that we get a high result uh, on the beaches. And so uh, that's, you know, always the really good news to share. <laughs> As a waterkeeper, sometimes we don't always have good news to share, but it's always nice to be able to say, you know, that DX sampling work out at the beaches is showing up, you know, with really good water quality. Uh, you know, if there is a high result, usually related to, you know, shorebirds and, you know, pelicans and seagulls and that sort of thing. Uh, so, you know, it, as far as water quality issues go, it, um, you know, the, one of the things I worry about the least is what water quality is like at the beaches. Mm. 
And Andrew, what is that trending data that you and your team are looking at right now that may be potential threats to the low country in the next couple of weeks or months? Right. Well, you know, uh, let me answer that question two ways. You know, okay. most immediately, it's 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 the bacteria, right? You know, is is it safe to be out tomorrow? Is it safe to be out, you know, this weekend? That sort of thing. Uh, and so, you know, again, folks can folks can get the data on our website. They can follow us on social media. We publish the data there as well. Uh, and so it's it's all there publicly available, so folks can you know make informed choices about what they're doing with themselves and their families. But I think when you look at more long term, it's some of the stuff that we don't even have rules or regulations for, right? Uh, you know, there's uh, uh, a system of regulations and permits that controls what, uh, let's say, the paper mill or a cement factory or uh, you know, some of these big industrial facilities way up the Cooper River, there's, you know, laws and regulations about what they're allowed to put in the water. Uh, but, you know, the thing is, we only, you know, we don't know what we don't know, right? Mm. There could be all kinds of different chemicals and pollutants coming through those waste streams. Mm. And so we are just starting to understand, we've got a really exciting project with NOAA right now that is looking at, um, Silicone wristbands, uh, you know, the wristbands that, that people wear, you know, what would Jesus do or, right. or like Lance Armstrong or, oh, yeah. or those sorts of things, right? And uh, the uh, the scientists over at NOAA have discovered that silicone is really, really good at soaking up contaminants in the water column. Oh. And so what we do is we go and install these things uh, and then we leave them out for a month. And then they soak up the contaminants. We hand them over to Noah, and Noah Noah tests them for two different kinds of pesticides and uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. So those are the things from uh, you know those are oils and greases from you know gasoline things like that, right? And <laughs> we we found those at every single one of our sites. Uh, and so we're working to understand you know where those are coming from. We're working to understand what you know whether they're present. Uh, different amounts during different seasons, what the concentrations are. And so there's some, there's a lot of work that really needs to be done to understand that, you know, the other types of contaminants that are out there as well. We know we have a problem with the little plastic nurdles. Oh, yes. uh, you know, we, we, we know, we know we have a problem with those. Uh, we know we have a problem with a class of chemicals called forever chemicals, which are uh, per and polyfluorinated chemicals that are used uh, as waterproofing or oil and grease inhibitors. Uh, those show up in really, really high levels in the local population of Gulf, uh, to, the, to the point where they have, you know, impacted the health of our local uh, local dolphin populations. And so there's some really scary stuff out there that we need to better understand and pinpoint sources and then clean them up, make sure we can stop that at the source. What do you, where do you see the population for the dolphins going in the next five to 10 years? Oh, wow. That's a great question. I hope, I hope we can sustain, look at it this way, dolphin are sentinel species, right? They're a uh, long-lived apex predator, top of the food chain in the water. And if the Charleston Harbor is healthy enough to support dolphin, that's a good sign. And so if dolphin populations are able to, to hold on and stay steady, that's good. I also look at the oyster. I think the oyster is another critical lens to look at water quality through. Uh, you know, the oyster enjoys the best water quality out of any marine life in the state. And so if our water quality is clean enough to support the oyster industry, then it's clean enough for dolphin, it's clean enough for you, it's clean enough for me, it's clean enough for the crabs, the fish, and everything else. So if we protect the oyster, we protect the dolphin, and we protect everybody else. And so I think that's a really important lens to look at water quality through. Absolutely. And I want to continue this conversation, but Zoom is not, yeah. not giving me enough time, unfortunately, <laughs> anymore. I used to go for uh -oh. an hour. Yeah. <laughs> I know how that goes. Yeah. Can I keep yeah. it tight? Keep right. it tight. <laughs> I guess I got to upgrade at some point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Quentin, it's been fun. It's yes, been right. really fun. Yes. I um, appreciate the chance to chat with you. And uh, maybe sometime we'll, uh, we'll get you on the water for some water quality testing. Sure. I'll be there. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Andrew, for your time here on Quentin's Close Ups. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure oh, talking with you. Likewise.